So that video I did on Chuck's Stick actually went over really well, but I got a lot of comments saying that it was a little prohibitive because of all the equipment that was involved in making it. And that's a totally valid point because you know what? Investing a hundred to many hundreds of dollars to try to make a $40 steak taste like a $400 steak is beyond the reach of a lot of people. So allow me to introduce instead the reverse sear. What you will need is a thermometer of some kind, the steak you are gonna cook, and the oven that you probably already have. This is the one that I'll be using Using. Her name is Sandra. She is probably older than my mother and I hate her. By her I mean Sandra, the oven. Not my mother. Preheat your Sandra to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. I know that's a very low temperature, but just bear with me. I know at the time in my head I was just doing a backwards peace sign, but now seeing this I do realize that I told a lot of my British viewers to f*** off, and I do apologize for that. In a reverse sear, you season your steaks as if you were going to just cook them regularly or sous vide them. That little hand thing that I do is to remind me that my seasoning hand and the hand that touches the meat are different. After all, you don't want any of those meat juices going into your jar of what is this? Umami punch? It sounds like a sex thing. Cross-contamination is bad and any little tricks that we can do to stop us from getting sick is always a good thing. For the second steak, I've decided to use some Rogan Josh seasoning. Rogan Josh is actually a Kashmiri dish that is normally made with lamb. I don't know how true to the dish itself this spice blend is, but it's got garlic, ginger, cumin, coriander, cardamom, cloves, and saffron in it, so it's good for me and good for this steak. Because I personally have no use for four pounds of steak in one night, I'm going to freeze the first part, and that is one of the advantages that sous vide has over reverse searing. You can season and freeze a steak and then cook it straight from frozen in a sous vide circulator. You can prep a whole bunch of steaks and then freeze them and then 24 hours before your dinner plop one in the circulator and have it ready when you need it. Back to reverse sear though, if you're going to use one of those thermometers that you leave in the steak, set your thing to 115 degrees for medium rare. Medium rare is actually 130 degrees Fahrenheit, but you want to set it 15 degrees below because you're going to pan sear it afterwards and that will finish the rest of the cooking. One really nifty thing is most of these are magnetized so you can just stick it on your oven. Just like that. I don't know why, but that tickles me. Today's side quest will actually benefit the main video. We're gonna make a steak sauce that is inspired by chimichurri. That beeping is actually the thermometer telling me the steak is done. I did not time this right. Normally I would set my oven at a lower temperature and let it come up to 115 more slowly, but I have Sandra, so this is what we've got. You notice that the steak does not look good. Luckily for us, the steak can hang tight, but for the sauce, you're gonna need some preserved tomatoes, some parsley, some oregano, some, there it is, white wine vinegar, as well as some garlic. This is on top of the ginger scallion oil and the chili oil that I showed you earlier, but realized just now that I did not tell you what they were. No, I feel like I do this in every single one of my videos, but there are new viewers popping in every time. This is my little two bowl garlic trick. It's a very easy way to peel your garlic if you need your garlic whole. That's apparently the face that I make when I decide to use four garlic cloves instead of three. So yeah, apparently what I think is happening when you do that, when you damage the garlic in this way, they, it releases oils in between the clove and the skin and it makes the skin easier to just peel off. Sometimes it comes off in the bowl and you don't have to do anything. Otherwise, it's just really easy to peel. So for the purposes of this sauce, I'm gonna make almost like a garlic paste. I'm going to first slice it really thinly and then really just mince it as finely as I possibly can. And then I'm going to scrape the garlic against the cutting board. And then here I'm gonna use some salt to add some grit to it. So when I scrape it even more, it turns into more of a paste-like consistency. Now to this garlic paste, I'm gonna add, I think this is like two, Two loose cups, yes, two loose cups of parsley. I'm making this sauce up as I go along. It's based on a chimichurri, as I said before, but otherwise I don't really know what I'm doing. So you're gonna finely mince this into the garlic paste. So as you go, it kind of mixes in very well together. I don't think it really does anything. Um, I just like, I just like doing it this way. Same thing with the oregano, kind of just like taking the leaves off of the stems, putting right in. Right now it's exactly like a chimichurri, but It'll, get, it'll, it'll change later on. I like how my narrative turned into more of a director's commentary than actual narration of a cooking video, but I've been drinking, <clears throat> excuse me. Here's where we veer off from the recipe a little bit. I'm adding sun-dried tomato as well as the paste 
like the sesame seeds and the chili paste of a chili oil. And I actually made this chili oil on a live with Golden Gully. So if you wanna see how I do that, go on his page and look at the live and we made chili oil together. Now, besides the tomato and the chili oil or the chili crisp, I should say, I added a nice like three quarters, quarter cup, maybe, yeah, about a quarter cup of ginger scallion oil. Chefs don't measure. We don't know what we're doing. When we give you a measurement, we don't know actually if that is right or not. And also finally top it off with a metric sploosh of uh, white wine vinegar to give it some balance. That was me trying that sauce for the first time. I really liked it. I liked it so much that I stopped what I was doing here and I went and wrote down the recipe and I put it in my book. But you'll get it on this video first because I love you guys. Anyways, the steak is ready which means now we have to sear it. That is why it's called the reverse sear technique. You actually sear the beef after you've baked it or cooked it in the oven, which is not how I actually cook any steak. So I don't know why it is called this, but in either case, it's a great way to cook a big cheap cut of beef. Now I'm searing this in a lightly oiled stainless steel pan. The beauty of steel pans is that they grip onto your proteins and they let it go when the sear is done. It actually tells you when it's finished. See, there you go. That little checker pattern happened because I put it on a grate, which maximizes the airflow when you're baking the steaks. That is a good thing because you want the surface to dry off on the steaks. It actually makes it easier to sear, which is one advantage that this has over sous vide because when the surface is wet, it doesn't sear as well. When the surface is dry, it tends to sear beautifully. Normally for a chuck roast, I would prefer my reverse sear to take about an hour in the oven. Because it is a tougher cut of meat, you actually want it to spend more time cooking so the enzymes have a longer time to break down the meat from within and give you something that is just as flavorful as a chuck would normally be, but very, very tender. But even still, I think this spent maybe 30 to 45 minutes in the oven and it was still as tender as I would say a stir sirloin steak would be. That's what people do here, right? They, they scrape the crust of the steak for some reason. I'm not sure why. Anyways, to describe this steak with this sauce, I. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it was so good. So chuck roast, as we know, is a super flavorful, beefy cut of meat. And then that just had all of the brighter spices from the Rogan Josh that were seared on top of it. And this, this sauce, you guys, like you had the chimichurri-esque, you know, the parsley and the garlic, but then you immediately get hit with these like very Chinese flavors of ginger scallion oil and the chili oil. The Szechuan peppercorns from the chili oil were bright and citrusy and still numbing. Mm -mm -mm. You really need to try this. I wasn't kidding. I had an idea that it would be good, but I wasn't prepared for how good that was.